Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm John Smith. I'm the director of the RISD Museum, and it's a tremendous pleasure to welcome all of you this morning uh, as we celebrate the opening of our new exhibition, Gorham Silver, Designing Brilliance, with today's symposium, Designing Innovation. I think for so many of us at the museum who have been focused on this exhibition for several years, uh, it's incredibly gratifying to finally see the project come to fruition so beautifully and to see this you know, incredibly enthusiastic turnout uh, this morning. So thank you for being here. Um, I want to begin by thanking all of the scholars uh, who are presenting today uh, and whose work has been so critical to our understanding of Gorham and its place within design history, and certainly within the history of uh, Providence in Rhode Island. And I also want to thank Deb Clemens, who is our muse the museum's assistant director for academic and public programs, for all of her hard work in organizing this morning's event. Deb has a way of making it all seem incredibly effortless, uh, but I think any of you who, uh, who've organized these kinds of events or have been part of them in the past know that it's anything but that. So I just want to thank Deb for her. And the other thing that anyone who's been involved in projects like this know that they don't come cheap. Uh, so I also want to thank all of the incredibly generous donors who uh, have really sort of underwritten uh, the exhibition, the catalog, and today's program as well, including the board of directors of the Henry Luce Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, our extraordinary RISD Museum Associates, the Textron Corporation, the Zinnovation Fund, the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, the Rhode Island State Council for the Arts, Spencer Gordon and Mark McHugh of Spencer Marks for their generous in-kind support, and individual donors, Dr. Joe Chazen, Scott and Cindy Burns, and Alan and Jenny Nathan. And I want to give a very uh, a special thanks to Vicki Vey, who, uh, through a very generous gift, underwrote uh, the costs of today's uh, symposium. So thank you so much, Vicki. <laughs> This exhibition could not have had a more passionate and knowledgeable curator than Elizabeth Williams, the David and Peggy Rockefeller Curator of Decorative Arts and Design here at the RISD Museum. When Elizabeth arrived at the museum six years ago, in the thick of completing her dissertation on Gorham, I knew that the time had come to give Gorham the scholarly attention it so justly deserved. And we're all deeply indebted to Elizabeth for bringing this project to life with such thought and care. Labor of love can be an overused expression, but in this case, it's never been more appropriate. I also want to acknowledge Emily Bannis, the Assistant Curator for Decorative Arts and Design. I know that Elizabeth would be the first to say that without Emily's efforts and hard work, this project would have been greatly diminished. So thank you, Emily. <laughs> and it's now my pleasure to turn um, the podium over to Elizabeth Williams. Good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to see you all together here this morning to celebrate the opening of Gorham Silver Designing Brilliance. And uh, just a, a few housekeeping notes. I hope everybody has a program. And uh, just to let you know, I'm going to give you an overview of the exhibition, tell you a little bit about how we put the exhibition together without stealing the thunder of any of our fabulous speakers today. And then we'll have two talks this morning. We'll break for lunch. And um, we also have uh, tours of the jewelry and metal smithing studios today. And then we will come back here promptly at 2 p.m. And Emily Bannis will share some behind the scenes moments with us. And then we'll have the remainder of our talks. At 4.30, we will have question and answers. So we're going to save all our questions and answers um, until the end, and we'll have all of the speakers come up on the stage, and you can feel free to ask any question you want. We do have um, index cards and pencils up here. If there's something you want to jot down during the course of the day um, that you want to remind yourself you want to ask about. 
And then um, at 5 p.m., we'll go upstairs to the gallery. Um, silversmiths, Gorham Silversmiths, will be in the gallery to answer all your silversmithing questions. And then the opening begins at 5.30. You are all welcome. It is open to all, and that's 5.30 to 7.30. And also during lunch, of course, the exhibition's open, so you are welcome to go upstairs um, and see the exhibition, of course, the reason why we're all here. Okay. Well, of course, the exhibition has opened today and it will be here at the RISD Museum until December 1st. And it's also traveling. It will go to the Cincinnati Art Museum and also the Mint Museum in 2020. So we're thrilled to have um, Gorham go beyond uh, the boundaries of Providence. Uh, just to give you an idea how I got started with this, this was my first encounter with Gorham Silver. This is the Buttercup pattern, and it was launched by Gorham in 1899, and in 1955, my mother chose it as her pattern when she married my father. So I think I was just kind of predestined uh, to, to be interested in Gorham from the very beginning. And this was my, my second encounter with Gorham, a little more of a significant um, encounter. This is a curio vase made by Gorham in 1879, owned by the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, and uh, where I began my curatorial career. And I saw this, and in short, I was hooked. And it became uh, the... Uh, the topic of my first uh, paper as I began my uh, dissertation studies or PhD studies, and there were many more that came after that, and then finally it became uh, the topic of my dissertation. And uh, I kind of joke, I would have had to come here to do research anyway, so why not just work here? Uh, but it is a, a moment when the stars aligned, and um, I'm very happy to be here and have uh, had the opportunity to uh, have this moment. And uh, Providence is a good place to come for uh, Gorham Silver, especially the RISD Museum. We own nearly 2,300 pieces of Gorham Silver, the largest collection in a public institution. We also own over 2,600 design drawings. So these are design drawings um, showing Gorham works such as this. They can be watercolor and gouache uh, presentation drawings, or a drawing such as this, which is a little bit more technical. It talks about the types of materials and the dimensions and how these pieces are put together. Um, the exhibition is based mainly on our collection here at the museum. However, as you can imagine, there are incredible pieces of Gorham throughout the country. And uh, we were very, very thankful that nearly 15 lending institutions joined in this exhibition with us. You see them here and their objects and you will see them all upstairs. Uh, we also had several private collectors be very generous with their collections and I would like to recognize Kathy Malavasic. She loaned um, quite a number of pieces that are in the exhibition. She has also given us over a dozen pieces of Gorham silver in the last several years that you will also see upstairs. And I would also like to recognize and thank Suzanne and Joel Sugg. They have put together an incredible collection of Gorm's Martelet line, one of the most important lines uh, that Gorm produced, and she has generously lended uh, these very important pe pieces that um, add exponentially to the exhibition. We have had other gifts um, to the Museum of Gorham Silver, many of which you will see um, upstairs. And as this exhibition is opening, I'm getting calls for many more. So we may continue to grow that uh, 2300 number. We also have made very significant acquisitions of pieces, these three especially that you see here, that represent objects uh, that we didn't have represented in our collection specifically for this exhibition. Now, beyond the museum doors, there are other fabulous resources for Gorham in the city of Providence. One, of course, is the John Hay Library that, at Brown University. They are the home of the Gorham Manufacturing Company archives. They own over 6,200 lineal feet of Gorham archival material. And uh, we thank our colleagues there. We spent a lot of time there and um, learned a great deal. Uh, they have 
things such as Jabez Gorham, the founder of Gorham's 1806 original certificate of indenture for his silversmith apprenticeship, and also his son John's diaries from 1852 and 1860 as he went about expanding the company after he <laughs> joined. They also have things such as this. These are very large scale photo albums. Gorham began photographing their products sometime between 1855 and 1856, which is simply extraordinary for them to be photographing at that early of an era and putting together a, you know, a catalog almost of their product with photographs. And finally, the RISD Fleet Library. In 2005, Gorm's Design Library. So this is a volume, a collection of over 1,500 volumes of design books that were owned by Gorm and served as references and inspiration for the designers. And they reside at the Fleet Library in the special collections and you can uh, contact them and look at uh, those various volumes. They have things um, such as unbound portfolios, just a images that were used as inspiration, um, design books, drawings, journals, and even an album of pressed seaweed. Now, being a Midwestern girl, I was familiar with pressed flowers, but not pressed seaweed. And uh, it's an important part of their production. If you look closely, you'll see a fair amount of seaweed, um, especially in the 1880s pieces. And of course, there is a publication, and it is the authors and the contributors of this publication that you will be hearing today share the knowledge that they gained and, and provided uh, as they researched their various topics. And uh, you can purchase one of these books, just a mere few footsteps from this auditorium, should you desire to. And here are the um, authors that will be speaking today. Now the catalog, the publication, as well as the exhibition are organized in five parts. And the first looks at Gorham and their history and also their place within American industrialism. Of course, the company was founded by J. Buzz Gorham in 1831 here in Providence. And it started in a very small shop, which you see here on Steeple Street. In 1841, John Gorham joined the firm, and he had great ideas about expanding the firm, and Jed Carboni is going to tell us all about that. But that small little building turned into this group of buildings that just expanded and expanded until it filled the block. And just to give those of you who aren't quite as familiar with Providence an idea of how close the first manufactory is to us, we are where the star is, and then that pink box is where um, the first manufactory was located. And just to give you an idea here, you're looking toward the First Baptist Church, the big white church that's uh, right next to the museum, looking east, and we would be kind of standing in the river looking back toward where Gorham used to be. 1876 World's Fair in Philadelphia celebrating the centennial of America was a very important year for Gorham, and it was a very important year for RISD as well. And um, the Women's Centennial Commission of Rhode Island came home from the fair with $1,675. They had a choice. They could build a water fountain in Roger Williams Park, wonderful, or they could found a design school. Thankfully, Helen Metcalf, who you see here, persuaded the group to found the Rhode Island School of Design in 1877, and here we are. In 1876, Gorham showed here in the main exhibition hall. This was one of many buildings. This was 21 acres inside. Another um, Providence, Rhode Island moment, the building was powered with this 56-ton Corliss steam engine produced here in Rhode Island. Uh, Ulysses Grant threw the switch. This is the interior of the main exhibition hall, and here is Gorham's pavilion, front and center. And we have several pieces that were shown at the 1876 World's Fair. One, I show you here, the Apern from the Ferber service, and you could see it in the shop window there. 
By 1890, the firm had outgrown their location in the heart of Providence. They purchased 37 acres in the Elmwood area, just a little south of Providence, and built this state-of-the-art manufactory. And again, just to give you a sense of orientation, the top star is where we are, and the bottom star is where the um, facility used to be. It is no longer there. And it expanded and expanded over the years. The second section looks at social and cultural history. Why was all of this silver being made? What were some of the reasons why it was being produced? Our Ferber service is a great example of explaining some of that. This is an 816 piece service made to serve 24 people. It has pieces such as this. It has hollowware, over 129 pieces of hollowware, and also 687 pieces of flatware. We are displaying it in a structure that represents Gorham's pavilions at World's Fair over the years, specifically this one in 1904. So you will see that when you go upstairs. And rather than a museum sort of um, installation in this area, you will see it is very densely populated with almost 80% of the Ferber service. And it really is meant to create, I mean, the service itself is a spectacle, and when you would go to the World's Fair, it would be an absolute spectacle. That was what it was meant to do. So hopefully you will get that effect. And here we are putting it together. I won't show you, for those of you who haven't seen it, I won't show you the completely finished work, but um, it was a, a real wonderful thing uh, to have it come together. Also, for the Ferber service, we have all of the original trunks. There are 20 oak trunks in which the Ferber service was stored. And you see some of them here. We chose trunk number 16, and Ingrid Newman, our conservator, as well as Laura Ostrander in our installation department, completely retrofitted it to look like this. And this is in the Ferber Pavilion as well. This is featuring 350 pieces of the Angelo pattern. There are about 12 different flatware patterns in the Ferber service, but this is the one um, that there is most of. Designing Gorham Silver, a very important aspect of the business, of course. And we have a lot of tea services, not surprisingly. They made a lot of tea services. And how do you show something like this, which is familiar to most people, and get them to look at it beyond, oh, that's a silver tea service. You know, how was this made? Who made it? And here are just... Um, a fraction of the tea services um, that are in the exhibition. And in order to get people to kind of stop looking at it in this typical arrangement, we put together this case. And this is the same form in three different services, obviously lined up so that the same form is next to one another. And the intent here is that you can see the differences and think about the choices that the silversmiths had to make in terms of the form, how many pieces, how was it going to be decorated, would it have gilding. So we hope that this is a moment that allows people kind of this close study and close looking at all the variety um, that Gorham produced. The wall behind it um, helps you do that. This represents over 300 different forms that the Gorham Manufacturing Company made. Now, of course, they made hundreds of others. We couldn't fit them all on the wall. And then, of course, within each form, they made dozens and dozens of different varieties of that particular form. Making Gorham silver. We're at RISD, we make things. So bringing in the maker and how things are made is something very important to us and we endeavor to bring that aspect into all of our exhibitions. Um, one of the things that um, we look at is of course design. This is the design plan of the manufactory that was in Elmwood. And once they opened that in 1890, they put together this album in 1892. And what is wonderful about this is it doesn't feature the silver so much, it features the building, and it features the spaces that people worked in, and it features the people who worked there. Um, it begins with things like the sales club,
clerks. You've got to have someone taking all those orders for silver. The experimental room where Gorham designers and silversmiths figured out how to make something. Um, one thing I really admire about Gorham is they chose to make something or decide they want to make something, create a design, and if they didn't have what they needed to make it, they came up with it. They made their own tools, they made their own machinery, they were highly inventive. And here, of course, we're in the preparatory room, so here is where the silver is actually made. And then finally, the case department. You've got to put all that silver in something. And building cases and the presentation boxes that these pieces went into um, was a very important aspect of their business as well. They were a um, full service company. In researching, we connected with a lot of local silversmiths, some even um, who had worked with Gorham in the past. And I really wanted to bring some equipment in. They wouldn't let me bring a drop press in, but uh, we did borrow quite a few pieces of equipment. And I would like to thank the people who contributed their time, objects, and expertise to help put this together. So this represents six different silversmithing processes. And above it is a video that is showing you how those processes are made. The video is composed of excerpts from two vintage films, one 1927 and one 1930, and then also images of contemporary silversmiths and jewelers demonstrating that technique, and then the objects that they're actually making in the video are in the cases below. And here they are shooting the video. They really went above and beyond, and I, I do hope you get a chance to see that and enjoy it. Um, Emily Banas is going to speak about kind of those behind the scenes moments of conserving and photographing, which was a very big and important part of this project. Um, those activities inspired our um, RISD Mellon faculty fellow in the decorative arts and design department. And he responded with two projects. And one of them I show you here. This is entitled Fetish. And he became very interested in what happens to an object when it enters the museum. It gets treated differently than it did as a functional object. And he filmed the teams that did the conservation and also that did the photography and took a very close look at how things are touched and cared and attended to while they're going through this process. And this really reveals uh, the way in which these objects are on a different type of existence when they come into the museum and this video you will see in the exhibition. The second project is called Antimatter, and it considers how things are made. Um, there are pieces from two Gorham tete -tet services, one that is made through traditional silversmithing skills and one that is completely electroformed. And Kai has made this hairy 3D teapot to join in conversation with these two tete -tet services. And this is both an ode to Oppenheim's cup and saucer, the, the furry ones, as well as the Utah teapot, which became a 3D test model that has become a standard reference and in-joke within the computer graphics community. So it just happens they picked a teapot that has become this standard reference. Finally, marketing Gorham Silver. Uh, Gorham continued to participate in many World's Fairs, and we have quite a few reunion cases. This is the 1893 reunion case, and also the 1900 Paris reunion case. And it is those lenders, at private and institutional, that have allowed these moments to come together to reunite these objects to enhance the exhibition. Gorham made things very small. We have a case of small wares, um, dressing sets. Everybody needs a sterling silver yo-yo, um, cigar lighter, traveling desk set, and of course, a letter scale. They also made things that were very large. This is the Admiral Dewey Cup. It is eight feet three inches tall. And here you see our crew putting it together. Thankfully, it does come apart into four pieces. 
They also made very big things for promotional objects. This might look like a typical coffee pot and spoon, but they are not. That spoon is four feet long, and it is 15 pounds of sterling silver, and the coffee pot weighs 25 pounds. Now, Gorham had fun with their promotions, and this is <laughs> surely evidence that they did. Um, we had a hard time choosing between the baby or the chimps, but we did go with the baby upstairs. Um, clearly, they took it to Roger Williams Park at the zoo, and uh, these chimps had fun with it. So we used them on either side of the exhibition introduction, and uh, I hope that you enjoy today and have fun. And I will now hand it over to Jed Carbone, who is going to, oh, I'm sorry, Holly Snyder is going to start us off, and then Jed's going to join in. Thank you.